What's up, world? Welcome to Cage Minds. I'm your host, Micah. We're normal set is under construction. Hopefully, we'll give you something better. We'll be back better than ever with a better set very soon. For right now, we're here to talk about UFC 139 and give you our predictions. There's 12 fights on this card, three great ones at the top of the main card. We're going to give you our little prediction on all of them. We'll get right to it. The first fight, Shamar Bailey, Bailey who is 12 and 4, is going to take on Danny Lascal Castillo, who's 11 and 4. Bailey fights out of Indianapolis, an alumni of the Ultimate Fighter. Good wrestling. He's fought at welterweight now, has dropped down to lightweight, very thickly muscled lightweight, who cuts down on weight, very strong. Good grappler. Castillo, member of Team Alpha now. Another very good grappler. Both men, they know they need to improve their stand up. When two good grapplers usually go head to head, we end up seeing a brawl, a striking battle, because neither one can really break down the base of the other man to achieve the takedown. Bailey's very good at doing takedowns. I wouldn't be surprised to see him try to do some of the steel rounds. Shamar Bailey is going to have a two to three inch reach advantage in this fight. He needs to, for the moment, his last fight, a loss to Evan Dunham that was primarily striking. He's going to be back in the gym and working on that jab. He has to be ready to use it, keeping that distance, keeping his range. Don't let Castillo turn this into a complete brawl. And he also has very good power in his left hand. Castillo, Castillo himself had demonstrated improved striking against Jacob Volkman, then Volkman outgrappled him. I think that we're going to see a primarily striking battle with Bailey stealing takedowns to steal rounds and winning unanimous decisions. So I got Shamar Bailey, unanimous decision. Next fight, Matthew Immortal Brown, who's 14 and 10, is going to take on Seth, the Poland, Polish Pistola, Bazinski, who's a 14 and 6. Matt Brown, 6 foot tall, Bazinski, 6'3". Brown, though, will enjoy a 3-inch reach advantage. Bazinski is going to be the physically bigger man, the stronger man, the more muscular man. He needs to turn this into a brawl. Immortal Brown would love nothing more than to keep this as a technical Muay Thai kickboxing matchup, keep his distance, and be able to land strikes and just take his man out of it. Bazinski needs to come in, be aggressive, land his takedowns, use ground and pound. I think he's going to be able to hurt Brown, outmuscle Brown, take Brown to the ground. And I'm calling a second round arm bar for Seth Bazinski. So we're taking Seth Bazinski with a second round arm bar, a little bit of an underdog over the veteran, Matthew Immortal Brown. Next fight, we're talking about Miguel Angel Torres, 38 and 4, versus the 6 and 2 Nick Pace. Miguel Angel Torres, remember, former WC Bantamweight champion, trying to get back to that level. It was my opinion that he didn't look that bad in this last outing. We know that he lost back to back contests versus Brian Bowles and Joseph Benavides. I don't think that he really looked that bad against Demetrius Johnson. He landed a ton of strikes off his back. Judges see things how they want. I don't believe that the guy that just lands takedowns and does nothing was more effective than the guy that was striking the whole time. That being said, Torres has found holes in his game and has went to drastically try to improve them, training with the Black Zillions, training with the TriStar Gym. Nick Pace, a tough New Yorker, has good power, has already fought a very veteran competitor in Ivan Menjivar, hurt him at the end of it. Crazy submission abilities for Nick Pace, too. No slouch. There's a reason why a 6-2 and two guy gets such a big opportunity versus a former champion. But I'm going to take the former champion, Miguel Torres, a split decision just because we still are not completely sure on how great his takedown defense is. So I got Miguel Torres, a split decision. The next fight is going to be a Brazilian battle at lightweights between, between the 33-7, and seven, Gleison Tebow, and Rafael Dos Anjos, who's 15-5. and five. Tebow's bigger. He's stronger. They're both Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belts. Tebow has more wrestling. I think he's going to use takedowns, use his ground and pound, kind of play it safe. As long as he stays away from a knockout punch from Dos Anjos, I don't really see Dos Anjos ending this fight. I think Tebow takes a unanimous decision victory. Next fight is Filthy Tom Lawler, who has a 7-3 and record, taking on the All-American Chris Weedman, who's 6-0. and Weedman is my pick to one day be the successor of Andrew of Anderson Silva in the middleweight division. Very high regard for his grappling capabilities as long as he avoids the power from Tom Lawler. I see Weedman winning this one. He has more crisper boxing. We saw what he did against tough veteran Alexio Sakara. I think he's going to make it 3-0 in the UFC. He may even pull out a submission. Lawler himself, a good wrestler, very well versed. I don't think he's going to by any means be a walk through the park, but I do undoubtedly see Weedman with a unanimous decision victory if he doesn't pull out the submission. I don't see Lawler being knocked out. Now we're going to get to the spike fights. That was all of our Facebook prelims. 
This last fight was added just a week ago, and it's Michael Mayday McDonald, who's 13 and 1, taking on Alex Soto, who's 6 0 and 1. Michael McDonald, we've seen him twice already in the octagon. Great prospect for a youngster, good hands, good wrestling, good all around mixed martial art abilities. Alex Soto. Uh, a Mexican who came to America, ended up be being in the Army, now became a mixed martial artist. Is 6-0 and primarily throughout the Mexican mixed martial arts circuit. I think now, I just like McDonald too much. I don't think he's going to fall for the ground and pound or be dominated and controlled by Soto. He may, Soto may win this fight off of doing ground and pound, top control, but McDonald's too slick on the ground, and I think he has too much power in his hands. I see him taking this one with a second round TKO. I just haven't seen enough of Soto to believe in his stand-up. I know he has a very good ground game, but it's getting there. That worries me for him. Our other spike fight is Darth Ryan Bader, who's 12-2, and two, taking on Jason, the hitman of Brails, who's 18-4-1. Both guys have great, outstanding amateur wrestling backgrounds, so we're going to see a brawling fight. Well, more like a boxing fight. Both of these guys really love boxing, just making it, mixing it up with the hands. If one of them was to add more kicks or more knees, that would give one or the other a defined advantage in the stand-up, but neither one has demonstrated that really in their repertoire. I would say that Bader wins this fight off of more combinations and more power, Brills wins this fight if he drags it to the ground and is able to achieve a guillotine. Bader should win this fight. I got him winning it by a third round knockout. I think he's going to catch Brills, hit him, hurt him, get on top of him, and pound him out. He can't play the submission game. He's lost two straight via the submission. Brills has good submissions. Bader wins this fight boxing, wrestling, boxing to wrestling. Brills wins this fight if it's boxing, wrestling, jiu-jitsu. Got Darth Bader, though, taking this one up in a third round TKO. Next fight now is Stefan Bonner, the American psycho, who's 13 and 7, versus Kyle Kingsbue Kingsbury, who's 11 and 2. Love the fights that Stefan Bonner puts on. We'll definitely be cheering for him in this fight. I just don't know if we'll have the physical strength to stop Kyle Kingsbury from moving forward, imposing his will, achieving takedowns, using his vicious Muay Thai clinch that he demonstrated versus. Uh, Fabio Maldonado. He needs to remember though to keep his ribs closed, keep his elbows down, watch out for those body punches. I just don't know if Bonner will be able to finish him. I think by the end of this we're going to see a 29-28 unanimous decision victory for Kingsbury as the two will primarily strike and if there's any waywardness in that striking game, Kingsbury's going to be the more effective, stronger guy in the clinch going for the takedowns, probably winning that battle and in succession winning the fight. Now a welterweight war. Martin, the hitman Catman, 17 and 5, will take on Rick, the horror story, who is 13 and 4. Oh, and my bad. Catman is 17 and 3, not 17 and 5. Sorry. I think that we're going to see Catman have to use his Dutch kickboxing and be more attentive and more aggressive. He lacked aggression versus Jake Shields, got taken down. He lacked it versus Diego Sanchez. Diego Sanchez pushing forward, won that fight. If Catman fights the exact same way, Story's going to win the fight the exact same way Diego did. Walking through shots, not scared of getting hit, landing a few of his own, achieving takedown, using pressure, ground and pound. That's the formula for story. That's how he fights. Catman has to be able to stay on his bicycle, kick the legs, take out the core. I hope that we see a real war. I hope that it's a great fight that I'm predicting, but I still think story and his offensive abilities are wrestling, his takedowns and his scrambling ability. It's going to be too much. Another 29-28 unanimous decision I think we'll see. Rick Story. Now we're up to what I feel is Coco main event of the night, where we have Uriah Faber, the California kid, who's 25 and 3, taking on Brian Bowles, who's 10 and 1. Both men are former WEC champions. This fight has implications leading to a UFC bantamweight title fight. Dominic Cruz took the belt originally in the WEC from Brian Bowles and beat Uriah Faber on a pay per view event here in the UFC. What I see happening in this fight is I think that. The other factors, the kicks that Faber uses, his scrambling his ability, him pushing Bowles against the cage, this is going to be what wins him the fight. Brian Bowles, very tough chin, one loss in his career and was due to a broken hand TKO stoppage where the doctor stepped in and stopped him. He hasn't been stopped, he doesn't have much weakness. Both guys have guillotines that can squish pumpkins. They're very strong in that hold, strong in that move. So shooting for takedowns may not be appropriate. I think we're going to see some more judo type of takedowns out of favor. Respecting bulls. They both know each other. They're friends. They like each other. But it's going to be a war on the feet. 
Bowles has great knockout power and capability. He could finish Faber with a knockout. Faber has been knocked out before by Mike Brown. I'm going to put a bet on this fight also that we see two broken hands, at least one from each guy because they're both notorious for doing this. But I'm thinking Faber is going to take a 29-20 unanimous decision. I see a lot of these fights on this main card being very close. It's going to be like a two rounds to one deal where that third round is going to be highly full of action. Now we get to the co-main event, the Axe Murderer, Vanderlei Silva, who's 13-11-1, is going to take on Kung Lee, who's making his UFC debut, who's 7-1. Vanderlei Silva, the axe murderer, great days in pride. A lot of us are predicting it, betting it. This could be his last fight, probably in mixed martial arts. Kung Lee's been knocked out once, and he's knocked out people six times. Vanderlei Silva, over 20 career knockouts. Someone's going to sleep. Someone's going to sleep fast. We just don't know about Vanderlei's chin. I think Kung Lee, with a head kick in the first round, about the four-minute mark, took a first-round knockout. Kung Lee, it's going to be a great fight for the time that it lasts. We just have not seen Vanderlei been able to be himself since he came over to the UFC. I don't think this fight works out any better for him. This takes us up to the main event of the night now. Uh, a sure knockout here coming too. Dan Hendo Henderson, 28 and 8, coming back to the UFC to take on Mauricio Shogun Rua, who's 20 and 5. The winner of this has implications to get the next lightweight title shot, well, in a few, after the Machida Jones fight and after Rashad gets the winner of that, we could hear Hendo or Shogun right back in there. We all know down Henderson, the H-bomb, his big overhand right. His mixed martial arts game has, instead of expanding, has kind of become more singular throughout the time. As he used to use his wrestling primarily and some ground and pound, now we just see him throwing that right, that deadly right hook, I mean, incredible, amazing, the guys that he's knocked out with it. The reactions to them, well, Michael Bisman will never forget that. The stuff that he's been able to do with it, but it's so singular. He doesn't use enough kicks. He doesn't throw enough lefts. I think that Shogun has too many weapons using his Muay Thai, using his knees, his elbows, his shins, his kicks, everything. I think that there's just more weapons towards Shogun Wing. If Henderson was inclined to take this to the ground and be more of a wrestler in the offensive takedowns category than just using it for a sprawl and brawl, I'd give him a lot more, I'd have a lot more faith in him winning this fight. Also, we got to think about the biggest variable. We're here out now six days from the fight. On the weigh-ins, we'll see how good the Shogun looked. A healthy Shogun is a fast, violent, dangerous man that will end this fight. I'm seeing it ended in the third round. It could be a strike leading to the ground to a rear naked choke, or it could be a TKO. If Shogun doesn't look well at the weigh-ins, we could all see Henderson land that H-bomb and knock him to sleep. But I'm taking Shogun in this one. So we're going to go back through our picks one more time. Shamar Bailey, unanimous decision. Seth Bazinski, I'm calling a second-round armbar. Miguel Torres, a split decision. Grayson Tebow with a unanimous decision. Chris Weedman, unanimous decision. Michael McDonald with a second round TKO. Darth Bader with a third round TKO. Kyle Kingsbury, unanimous decision. Rick Story, unanimous decision. Uriah Faber, unanimous decision. Kung Lee, a first round TKO. And Shogun, I like that prediction of a strike leading to the ground in a rear naked choke in the third round. I'm taking Shogun. This has been Cage Minds. Thanks for watching. Like the video, comment on the video, tell me what you think. Follow me on Twitter. Hit us up on Facebook. And remember, everybody, to uncage the warrior within yourself. Have a good night.